At the height of the Roman Empire, the allure of exotic goods such as silk, frankincense, and myrrh from the Far East was bound up in mystery. No one knew the secret of that featherweight fabric called silk and which faraway kingdom produced it. It was believed that Arabia was a mirage and that winged snakes protected its incense. Because of this veil of mystery and the high cost of transportation, the Roman elite regarded these precious commodities as exclusive status symbols. For centuries, these luxurious goods traveled thousands of miles along rough and perilous routes that linked the Far East and the West. Through written accounts and archaeological fieldwork, scholars have pieced together enough evidence to trace these ancient roots to their source. In the first century AD, silk from China traveled along the famous Silk Road to the Roman frontier outpost, the city of Palmyra, located in modern-day Syria. Pepper and precious stones were sent across the Indian Ocean to the southern tip of the Arabian Peninsula to what is now Yemen, and then on to Petra in modern-day Jordan. Together with the locally produced incense and myrrh and cinnamon from the Horn of Africa, the silk traveled north by caravan up the incense route to North Africa and Europe. A whole network of ancient caravan trading routes and cities such as Petra linked China through Arabia and the Middle East to the great cities of the Mediterranean. After searching for many years, Archaeologists discovered that these time-worn, wind-blown ruins were the remains of the once affluent city of Marib. It was here in Marib that caravans picked up the sap of local frankincense and myrrh bushes that was the source of the incense trade. These remaining walls and other finds led to the discovery of an extraordinary work of engineering in both scale and the period when it was built, eight centuries before Christ. Archaeologists realized that the walls were part of a huge hydraulic system, the legendary Dam of Marib, located in the ancient kingdom of the Sabaean, in what is now modern-day Yemen. Imagine a half-mile-long dam built in the middle of the desert. The basin of the dam collected the abundant waters from seasonal monsoons that flowed down from the coastal mountain range to the desert. The monumental dam lasted almost 1,300 years until its collapse in the 5th century AD, marking the end of the wealth of the Sabaeans. The dam at Marib was an engineering marvel. A complex system of channels distributed water that irrigated over 12,000 acres until it was buried by the desert sands. Who were the Sabaean people with the capability to build such a huge project? They inhabited the southernmost tip of the Arabian Peninsula more than 2,800 years ago. Their fame is forever linked to a biblical figure, the Queen of Sheba. This legendary and beautiful Sabaean queen crossed the deserts of Arabia to meet the wise Israeli king of the Jews, Solomon, by whom she had a son. Historians endeavored to discover where the beautiful Queen of Sheba came from. Excavations have uncovered a series of five elegant, flat-sided, monolithic columns which are believed to be the remains of the Temple of Bilkis, the true name of the Queen of Sheba, and the temple is where she was worshipped by the Sabaeans as a goddess.
Further on our lost desert highway, we find Sana'a, Yemen's magnificent capital, where the incense and spice trades still flourish. It is here that we find the National Museum and the origin of these ancient people. This image is another biblical figure, Shem, son of Noah. Shem founded the age-old capital of Sana'a and gave rise to a Semite tribe, one of three ethnic groups into which humanity was divided. Numerous finds made in Yemen tell us more about the Sabean civilization. These carvings are of particular interest, known as Betel, or House of God. They are masks venerated as fetishes and were seen as the embodiments of the gods. But gods had many forms. One of the god's caravan chiefs prayed to before setting off into the lonely night of the desert was the moon. In a hot country like Arabia, the moon was venerated much more than the sun. The resins of the frankincense and myrrh trees that grew only in southern Arabia fueled the luxurious cities along the incense trade routes. This is why the Romans called the kingdom of Sheba Arabia Felix, happy, flourishing Arabia. The discovery of this inscription, an ex voto, revealed a great deal of information about the daily life of those involved in the caravans. Two caravan chiefs who survived the perilous journey through the desert wrote this inscription, found on the walls of Barrakish in northern Yemen. The text bears witness to the wars, thieves, and natural disasters that the caravans had to endure. But perhaps the greatest danger they faced was running out of water. The incense route ran north along the Arabian Peninsula. Ancient wells and villages, such as Barrakish, provided caravans a place to stop and replenish. In Barrakish, water was collected in a well, and an ingenious hydraulic system pumped the cool water to the surface. A camel can travel for two to four days without water. The caravans traveling the incense route would make about 65 stops for water, depending on the season. Successful water stops were thus an indispensable part of their journeys. For centuries, legends and age-old texts elaborated on one of these desert ports, a fabulous ancient city hidden deep within the Jordanian desert. It wasn't until the late 19th century that a Swiss explorer named John Ludwig Burckhardt began his own search for this fabled lost city that seemed to have disappeared into thin air. From Bedouin stories and tales, Burckhardt believed that the lost city of Sila, or in Greek Petra, must lie not far from the Red Sea. Petra was also mentioned in the Bible as the place where Aaron, the brother of Moses, was buried. Burckhardt believed that if he found Aaron's tomb, he might also discover the lost city of Petra. Burckhardt knew that the Arabs who venerated Aaron would never allow a Christian near his tomb. So, disguised as an Arab in Muslim robes, Burckhardt hired an Arab guide to take him to Aaron's tomb so that he might make a sacrifice. The guide led the Swiss explorer through a long cleft or seek. After walking for more than half an hour, Burckhardt arrived at a stunning sight. In front of him was a huge building known from local legend as the Treasury of the Pharaoh, carved in the sheer face of the red rock cliffs. A carved urn set high on the facade was believed by legend to contain a mysterious treasure. Many bullets have been fired at the urn to unearth the treasure, but to no avail. The treasury of the Pharaoh was only the beginning of one of the most amazing archaeological discoveries ever made, the ancient city of Petra. Burckhardt never managed to reach the tomb of Aaron to make his sacrifice. His guide, suspicious of the explorer's true intentions, cut short their tour of Petra, 
but Burkhardt's accounts about his journey revealed an ancient city built into the natural amphitheater of rock that had been lost for a thousand years. The incense caravans would arrive at Petra after a six-month journey through the desert. The inhabitants of Petra, known as the Nebataeans, would offer them water, food, protection, and their hospitality for a 25% tax on every business transaction. The Nebataeans, who lived in tents along the floor of the canyon, would offer their humble homes so the caravan members could rest. The purpose of the carved buildings and monumental facades at Petra is still veiled in mystery, as puzzling today as it was in Burkhardt's time. One of the more impressive monuments in Petra is known as Deir. It is more than 120 feet high and 150 feet wide. Dating back to the first century BC, these rock temples were originally covered with white plaster, a marble-like effect which likely dazzled visitors. Today, in this city of ghosts, the Tomb of Silk is one of the most famous monuments. Natural erosion, wind and rain have stripped bare any of the original plaster. But the infinite veins of natural color in the rock and minerals from which it was carved provide an unforgettable spectacle. The ancient historian Didorus Siculus said that the population of Petra was composed of settled ex-nomads who were forbidden to grow wheat, plant fruit trees, drink wine, or build houses. Even today, no trace of the early private houses has ever been found. This would explain them living in tents along the valley floor. But the nomadic tradition of hospitality known in ancient times is still carried on by the Bedouin tribes living in camps around the extinct city today. With the arrival of the Romans, a real city was built in Petra in the first century AD, as can be seen from the remains of this column-lined avenue and theater. The city then declined during the height of the imperial age from the third century AD onwards, when the focus of commercial routes shifted further north. Roman historians reported the location of another outpost city at an intersection where the Silk Road and the Incense Route met. Many archaeologists set out to locate this mysterious city, believed to be buried under the vast expanse of the Syrian desert, somewhere between the modern borders of Jordan and Iraq. It was in this vast desert that a large number of columns were found. Various fortified sites or castles built during the Crusades used materials taken from cities constructed almost 1,000 years earlier. In fact, it was a site found in the desert overlooking one of these Crusader castles that drew the interest of archaeologists. As they pieced together the ruins and erected many of the fallen columns in their original placements, it was clear what had been found was the remains of the spectacular ancient city of Palmyra. In Palmyra, the glorious city of palms, archaeologists discovered one of the longest and best preserved column-lined avenues of the ancient world. Palmyra became the focus of the trade caravans and deprived Petra of its livelihood because it was so perfectly situated at the intersection of the silk and incense routes. The two most precious commodities in a desert are shade and water. Traders coming to Palmyra could stroll along the city's shady porticos and do business. They could also replenish their water supplies from the nearby Efqua oasis. In return, they would pay a high duty tax which contributed to the city's opulence. The original portico was even more ornate than the remains now lead us to imagine. 
This great arch appears quite normal, but in fact, it is a creative urban design solution to an intricate problem of symmetry. The base of the arch is triangular to accommodate two facades that are not parallel. This is because the avenues were not all built perfectly straight. As Palmyra became rich, it grew without an overall city plan. Buildings and roads were constructed and intersected each other at random. To deal with these stylistic problems, a brilliant urban designer conceived a solution and created a monumental arch with two facades that were perpendicular to the streets they faced. The design allowed anyone approaching the arch to enjoy a full frontal view of the monument, no matter the direction. The ancient caravans traveling north from Petra visited Palmyra as far back as the first century BC. The archaeological remains that we see there today date from about the second century AD, when the city was at its height. The shady porticos, statues, and magnificent buildings such as the Tetrapylon were built during this time. The Roman theater is extremely well preserved, retaining most of the stage area. The theater employed a second floor and together was over 50 feet high and 150 feet wide. The richly decorated central door, the largest of five doors, opened onto the stage and was known as the director's door. The facade held four main columns with floral friezes. The theater was positioned so that the setting sun would light the stage area, bathing the stone in an infinite range of colors. The caravan traders, having sold their spices, incense and myrrh to merchants in Palmyra for gold and precious stones, would bid farewell to the city and head back home toward Petra and Marib. Before leaving on their dangerous journeys, with the risk of bandits and desert storms, caravan traders would beseech the goodwill of the gods for a safe journey home. The greatest of the local gods was Bel, similar to the Roman god Jupiter. This massive temple was built during the Roman period. The huge sanctuary built in his honor formed a rectangle 672 feet wide by 688 feet long. The temple was located at its center. The high outer wall of the sanctuary was smooth and adorned with inset Corinthian pillars on the inside. An arcade with a double row of columns, numbering almost 300, formed another perimeter. The god Bel, venerated in the sanctuary, was a mixture of the man-like Greek and Roman gods and the embodiment of the natural forces sacred to the Egyptian and Arab peoples of the desert. Bel was the Lord God, embodiment of the luxurious vegetation that resulted from the presence of water, which could clearly be seen in oases such as Palmyra. The wealth of the city is evident in the long, elegant columns and the colonnade that surrounds the temple on four sides. The capitals were actually made out of bronze, another clue to how rich the city was in ancient times. Entering a long stairway located on the wide side of the temple allowed access to the interior of the sanctuary, a clear indication of Mesopotamian influence. Worshippers would climb the stairway to reach a portal and the statue of the god. Here they would bow down in the presence of power, make a sacrifice and a donation to the temple priests. An unusual feature of the temple was the opportunity of climbing up to the roof. The access stairways were hidden within the four turrets abutting the upper terrace. 
The size difference between the relatively small temple and the much larger surrounding courtyard was another feature of Mesopotamian design. This extraordinary temple shows the Mesopotamian influence in the geometric motifs of the roof decorations. The Western-inspired columns are imports from the Roman culture. After sacrificing a goat and making a substantial donation to the temple priests, the caravan chiefs would begin the long journey back to their homeland. Back, perhaps, to the ancient city of Sana'a, capital of Yemen, where the incense route began long ago. The city has undergone countless transformations over the centuries, but still seems to retain a mysterious allure. With its magnificent tower homes, its colorful past, its legendary Queen of Sheba, and its riches, Sana'a is endowed with a romantic and fabled history. Indeed, with the stories its ancient caravan chiefs could tell, it could well be a story itself in the Arabian classic, A Thousand and One Nights. <laughs>